today and let some music minister to your heart and uh, we will worship the Lord together. Uh, we will gather together tonight at six o'clock. We'll be here for our evening service and uh, we will uh, have some more uh, things tonight that will hopefully be a help and encouragement to you. So we'll join together at six tonight. Uh, Wednesday we'll be here at six for youth hour and Bible study at seven. So I encourage you young people to come for that if you can. And we have our calendars for 2022. I still keep forgetting we're in 2021 and it's just about over. But uh, there's a stack on the tables in the hallway at both ends. Take as many as you feel you can use and or give away. There's uh, a lot more than what's on the table. So feel free to take some of them today. And uh, if you have some that you want to give to family or friends, uh, feel free to take whatever you will use. Uh, it's no good to have them sitting on a table here in the building. Until next November, uh, they might as well be hung on somebody's wall uh, where they can keep track of time and hopefully read a Bible verse every now and then. I will encourage that. So uh, feel free to take some calendars today and uh, let them uh, help you throughout the year. Well, this coming Thursday is Remembrance Day, so today we're going to talk a little bit about freedom. And the Bible tells us in Galatians 5 and verse 1 to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We have liberty in the Christian life. We have liberty in our country. And we're thankful for the many soldiers that fought and died uh, for that freedom. And uh, I am thankful for the freedom we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about a couple of those things today uh, in our preaching time. So I hope that that will be a help uh, and a blessing to you this morning. We're going to pray together first, and then uh, Sarah's going to play a piece on the piano after I read the lyrics to uh, the hymn. Or, no, sorry, uh, we'll read the lyrics to the, to the song on the screen, and uh, after that we will look at a hymn together this morning uh, that Sarah and I will sing for you. But let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to help us please Him as we worship Him today. Our Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house. We thank you so much for this privilege to gather in uh, to a building where we can meet together, where we can encourage each other, Lord, where we can praise you and pray to you and hear your word preached. And uh, Lord, this is good and right uh, thing to do today. And I just pray that you would encourage our hearts today, help us to be thankful for the freedoms we have in our country, but more importantly, help us to know spiritual freedom. And Lord, that we would praise you for those things. Thank you for those that are here this morning. We pray for those that could not be here. Some are uh, working, others are sick. I pray that you'd meet their needs where they are. And those that are watching at home, that they would be helped and encouraged as well. We thank you now for all of this, and we ask for your blessing upon us. Meet with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
should make her play the piano more. So this is our opportunity. We'll get to hear her again and uh, read some short, uh, but some great truths in those uh, psalms. Praise the Father. Uh, praise Him for all the good things He has done for us. And there was a couple of snippets of the Hallelujah chorus in there. If you managed to catch those. And I hope that was a blessing to you this morning. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. In the hymn book that we normally sing out of, number 478, is Constantly Abiding. I'm going to read the lyrics for you, and then Sarah and I are going to sing a little bit of a different arrangement from the hymn. But I hope that it's a blessing to you this morning. But I'd like for you to consider the words uh, while we sing them this morning. Verse 1 says, There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely. Whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee. Jesus is mine. The second verse says, all the world seemed to sing of a Savior and King. When peace sweetly came to my heart, troubles all fled away, and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious thou art. This treasure I have in a temple of clay, while here on his footstool I roam. But he's coming to take me some glorious day, over there to my heavenly home, constantly abiding. Jesus is mine, constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee. Jesus is mine. I hope you know that piece this morning, and as we sing that song, let the words of it minister to you. Oh, 
some verses later in that chapter uh, this morning. Uh, so I thought we could read the first uh, section of verses uh, so to kind of give us some context uh, for the verses that we will look at uh, just uh, a little later. Romans chapter 6, if you have a Bible, we're going to read the first 11 verses together. I'd like you to read them out loud with me, please, if you would. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse number 1, will end at verse number 11. Let's read together. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word as we see there that we should be dead to sin so that we do not serve sin. Let's take a moment this morning to pray together about a couple of things. I will mention what we uh, normally pray for. We always ask the Lord to bless our offering. We give back to the Lord just a portion that he's given us uh, as an act of worship. And we pray for our missionaries, uh, Paul Connor and his wife Jeanette and their four boys at City Baptist Church in Vancouver. And the Lord blessed them uh, last Sunday. They had a special, uh, I think it was their anniversary Sunday. They baptized some people, had a family or two join their church. Uh, and uh, they are just excited about what the Lord is doing there. Uh, we're praying for the little family. They are now back in Canada. They left St. Lucia this past week and are now in Nova Scotia. They have some medical issues to take care of, as well as uh, seeking clear direction where the Lord would have them go next. So. We need to pray much for them that they, uh, they've had a difficult week. It was hard for them to say goodbye and uh, move and leave. Uh, and uh, now they're just asking God to give them some definite peace about where he'd have them to go. Mm -hmm. Of course, we need to pray for our government officials as they continue to make decisions and trying to deal with the uh, COVID-19 situation. We need to pray for those even in our own town that are still sick and ailing with it, that uh, we would not have any more outbreaks and uh, Continue to pray for my brother Ross and his health needs. So uh, let's take a moment this morning and mention these needs to our Savior and ask for his help. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you have given us the privilege 
to come directly to your throne of grace, as we're told in Hebrews, to find help in our time of need. And we pray this morning that you would meet our needs. I pray for my brother as he continues to uh, gain some strength, and uh, Lord, that you would just continue to help him and meet his needs. We pray for those even in our own town today that are sick or ailing from the COVID-19 virus, that you'd strengthen their bodies as many children were sick. We just pray that you would place your hand upon each one and help them. Lord, we pray for our council and the, the provincial government officials and our federal government as they make decisions, uh, trying to uh, allow things to move forward uh, without uh, too much uh, distraction. And, and I just pray, Lord, that you give them wisdom to do the right things. Lord, I pray for our missionaries. Lord, I pray that you bless the little family today as they are back in Canada, which I'm sure they're pleased to see some family and friends. But Lord, it's been a very difficult week for them to say goodbye to the ministry that you had uh, allowed them to serve in over these few years. And I pray that you would give them help with their medical issues. And I pray that you would give them clear direction as where you'd have them to go and serve you next. We pray for City Baptist Church in Vancouver that you bless uh, the ministries there today. And bless Pastor Connor and others that lead those services. And Lord, I thank you for those that are faithful here. I thank you for each one that has uh, joined us this morning. I pray they help us to be faithful in uh, giving of our tithes and offerings. Help us to be faithful in giving out the gospel to others. Help us to continue to have a good testimony uh, in our community and to those that know uh, us as people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, Lord, we ask that you would meet with us during the rest of this service, that we please you in everything we say and do. I pray it now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Sarah and I are going to sing another song for you in just a moment. It's based on a verse of scripture, James chapter 1 and verse 17. The Bible says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good and perfect gift is from above. I hope you know the gifts of God in your life today. Let the words to this song encourage and help you today.
Sing and to his voice with grace, lift up our God above. Let your light so shine in this darkened world, reflect our Father's love. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of light, every day's unchanged forever raised with makes his face to shine upon his child. Amen. Thank you again, ladies, and I hope that was an encouragement to you that every good thing comes down from the Father of lights. Well, it says up here to go to John 8, but don't go there yet. We're going to end up in John 8. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 in your Bibles this morning. The Old Testament book. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Again, as I was considering and praying about what the Lord would have me preach today, I was working on a couple of different sermons. And then uh, I was uh, thinking about the week ahead, and then I realized that uh, it was Remembrance Day this week. It kind of snuck up on me, and I was uh, thinking about that. And then I came across a little story that really uh, kind of touched my heart and affected me a little bit. And it kind of worked together with this idea of freedom this morning, and I began looking into scriptures. And uh, I trust that this morning what uh, I uh, believe God has for us is something that will help you. I have a lot of territory to cover in an introduction. They say I've got a long front porch uh, to get into the house. Once we get into the message, uh, I don't have a big lot to say. But there, there's a lot of lead up to it. So I hope I don't bore you to death. Uh, and I hope that it helps you uh, this morning. And... Uh, I did a little bit of uh, research, not a big lot, uh, but uh, there is, we enjoy freedom today because of the sacrifice that many others have made. Uh, just last night, my mother was, uh, she's been reading through a book that my grandfather wrote. I never did get to meet my grandfather on my dad's side. Uh, his name was Joshua Stansford. And he was from Grace Gulf, and he wrote a book entitled 50 Years of My Life in Newfoundland. And he was a very interesting man from what I've learned about him. He kept uh, not necessarily a diary. It's, it was more of a journal, but it was almost a minute by minute. I, I've actually read some of the journals. They've been saved. Uh, we managed to rescue a few of them from an attic. And uh, uh, I've been able to read some of them. And he basically accounted for everything he did every five minutes. I'm going to turn this fan a little bit. I'm not enjoying the, the cool air not blowing on me. But he basically wrote down everything he did every day. He wrote down what the weather was like. He wrote down if he spent five cents. And back when he was alive, five cents was a lot of money. But he wrote down everything he did in these journals. And I mean, there were stacks and stacks of these big uh, hardcover journal type books and he wrote the date and everything he did and eventually he put together a book 50 years of his life and I think basically what he did was go back through his journals and turn them into kind of a story as he went through and talked of as many uh, different things and, uh, my mom sent me a couple of uh, pictures of a couple of pages that I believe uh, must have been during World War One. He was, a, he was a poet, he was an author, uh, he ran a shop in Great Skull. If you don't know where Great Skull is, it's all the way at the very tip of uh, the Avalon Peninsula where Conception, or Conception Bay and Trinity Bay meet. It's right up on the end. And a uh, little community up there in between Old Perlican and Bay de Verde. And uh, he was uh, a man that was not well educated as far as schooling went i think uh, he went to school for about 18 months during his lifetime but a very well uh well educated in the in the world and, and as far as writing and reading and 
He was called upon to compose a war song, which he wrote, uh, he said, to the tune of Tipperary. And I'm not going to sing that for you because I don't know that tune very well. <laughs> when everything was silent in the light of Gospel Day, there sprang the world's great crisis far across the Atlantic Sea. Then rushed the good Canadians, speedy for their sovereign's gain, and soon the fields of Europe lay entrenched with bloody stain. That's verse 1, and this was the chorus. Heed the calling and respond to. Let all us join and sing. For to keep those colors waving, you must serve your country and your king. Young men must leave their mothers and husbands their wives. Where the German shells are bursting round them, God spare their precious lives. He wrote another five verses. I'll read those for you. The hardy sons of Ireland go to try their luck again. They flocked up to Lord Kitchener with the blood of Irishmen. The London streets are crowded. On all faces there is a smile. We never lost one battle from that mighty emerald isle. The sons of orange and of green are fighting side by side. To save United England, her dominions far and wide. To gain her independence from the Tuto German slave, will wave the flag of victory while Britannia rules the wave. There's a cry from Australasia, you our helping hand will get. We've come to save the empire where the sun did never set. We've cannons, rifles, bayonets, ships, and hardy soldiers too. We'll cross the bold Pacific with our tragedy in view. My plucky Newfoundlanders who did nobly brave the fight all for king and country, and did battle for the right. They lived and died for freedom, as they firmly took their stand. They lie today, the heroes of brave little Newfoundland. May the one great arm protect us all and dash away all fear. When this great conflict closes, see the end is very near. And in that great millennium, may we number with the blessed, where the remnant of all nations will be gathered there to rest. He goes on to write after that and says, on February the 3rd, we had splendid news from the battlefront to the effect that England and France had captured four large cities in Germany and that over 20,000 German soldiers had been killed or wounded. And in another place, uh, I think it was on another picture I didn't print off, he spoke of after this meeting, uh, they had arranged a patriotic meeting and after so many young men came forward and uh, over here, after the meeting, seven young men responded and volunteered for active service. And in World War I, 66,944 people lost their lives. An armistice was signed on November 11th in 1918 in a railroad car uh, by German delegates uh, that had been presented by the Supreme Allied Commander Marshal Ferdinand Falk. Great numbers of uh, people lost their lives in World War I. Of course, we know the story of Beaumont Hamill when Newfoundland sent that regiment of 780 members into battle and all, 300 survived uh, of that almost 800 people, but only 68 were able to stand and go to roll call the next morning. And I've heard it said, I haven't been able to find it and confirm it, but I've, I've heard it said that those of those 68 that were able to return to roll call the next morning, they had one question. And their question was, was the colonel happy with our work? 400 plus people died. But those that survived just want to make sure, hey, did we do okay? Did we accomplish anything? In World War II, I looked at the number I had on, on the paper and I said, that can't be right. I need to look that up. I had 60 million casualties. I said, that can't be right. I got to check that. So I looked it up and it's an estimated total of 70 to 85 million people perished in World War II. About 3% of the world's population in 1940. Deaths directly caused by the war, including military and civilian fatalities, are estimated at 50 to 56 million, with the additional 19 to 28 million deaths from war-related war disease and famine. 
At the time, the population of Canada was 11 million, and 1 million served in the war. 45,300 Canadians died. 102 of those were Newfoundlanders. And in fact, uh, my it would be my great uncle, my aunt's uh, father-in-law, served in World War II, and just this past week he turned 100, He's living in a home in Carboneer and still uh, doing well as far as his health and, and mind are concerned. But he was 100 years old, and he served in World War II. 45,300 Canadians died, 53,174 were wounded, and 1,843 went missing and were never found. I thought about the Korean War, I had to go look it up. More than 26,000 Canadians served in the Korean War, and 516 Canadians died in what was the third deadliest conflict in Canadian history. And then the latest war that went on in Afghanistan and over in those places, 165 people died, 158 soldiers and seven civilians. What we are doing right here today is a result of the sacrifices those people have made over the years. Over those conflicts when people went to war and were willing to face gunfire and run into it, trying to win a battle so that we could have freedom today. Freedom to attend a church service, freedom to read God's word, and we'd like to have the freedom to sing. Freedom. How much do you desire freedom? This past Friday and Saturday, we had a pastors and families fellowship in Carboneer, all the pastors from the island, the independent Baptist churches. We met at Cornerstone Baptist Church. We do that just about every year. In November, we get together for a couple of days. And, uh, we had a fellowship time Friday afternoon, some testimonies. We had a meal together, a jigs dinner with some moose meat. It was delicious. Friday night, Pastor Holman preached, and I'm going to share with you most of his message in a very abbreviated form. And we usually try to find a place to stay. We've done a lot of different things. We've stayed in motels. We've stayed at friends' houses. We've stayed in an empty house that was up for sale, but there was no one living in it. And we squatted there for a night. This year, we decided to try something different, and we booked an Airbnb, the Airbnb, Airbnb breakfast type place. And it was a 105-year-old house. We had a little bit of trouble finding it, but we got there. It was a beautiful little place. You know, the house was, was well kept. And it was, but the view out the front windows was incredible. I took that view standing in the kitchen. That's through the kitchen window. And then I took a step back so you could see the table that I put. This was out, there was two big picture windows in this place that we stood at. And this is a place that's called Crocker's Cove. Uh, out around this first point and in there is Carboneer Harbor, where you go into of Carboneer, we saw some fishing boats going back and forth, and it was just a, a beautiful place. And the house had, you know, it had everything in it, some furniture and old dishes and towels, and, and in one little corner they had some shelves and they had some books on there. I began looking through the books and there was a lot of books about Newfoundland, and I, I began looking and I, and I picked down two. There was one that I had read before and there, there was some information that I had, I read in that book and I'd forgotten, or I read in a book and I'd forgotten where I had read it. And I thought this might be the book. So I, I looked through that book and I found that information, so I was quite pleased. And there was another book that was there. It was simply titled Newfoundland, written by a man named Harold Horwood. So I took that book down and began looking at it. Basically, what this uh, Mr. Horwood did was I think he just traveled around the island. And he went to every little town and then he went back and he wrote this book. He was basically a historian uh, type of uh, guy and he, he wrote this whole book. So I, I glanced through it and they had a they had a, a chapter entitled Bright and Bitter Bjorn. I was like, well, now I gotta find out what he said about Bjorn. And I said, I'm not gonna go right to that chapter. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work my way through and uh, find out what uh, he had to say about Bjorn. So I, I began looking through and uh, and I came up, uh, I was flipping through and I saw a page and it said Grace Cole, which was where my dad was from. And uh, he wrote there, because down in Grace Cole, legend says, uh, no one's able to historically prove it, but legend says 
that when John Cabot came over to his first uh, uh, voyage to the New World, that he and two men from his boat got out and chiseled their names in the rocks uh, down in, in uh, Great's Cove. Uh, on the, there's just a real a big steep cliff there. And it's, it's been a legend for many years, but then someone came in and, and they chiseled that out and took the rocks and nobody knows if it's real or not. But he, he had a whole paragraph on that and, and he said their names were written there and he couldn't find it. He wasn't sure if it was true, but just an interesting story. And then on the bottom of the same page, I saw the words Crocker's Cove. And, and I had, uh, because we had a little trouble finding the place, uh, and we had found out that this little area was called Crocker's Cove. Well, I must see what it says about Crocker's Cove. And the story is told in 1697. 16, I got here in 1967, but that's wrong. I have to change that. I got my numbers mixed up. In 1697, the English and the French were fighting. And the English had captured an Irish, a young Irish fellow. And, a, and he said in the book that the English would keep the Irish as slaves. And the English had caught a young Irish lad, and they were using this, it's called Carboneer Island. When you're in Carboneer, you look out, you can see the island right at the end of the harbor. This is called Carboneer Island. They were using that to keep the prisoners on. And the, the book says that this young fellow escaped and from this island and swam to Crocker's Cove. Now, I was sitting, not at this window, the, there was another window over here in the living room, and I was sitting in this living room in the rocking chair reading this book, and I'm reading this paragraph as I'm looking at that island, and it happened in January of 1697. A young fella got off that island, and I can only assume, I have no idea, but if it was me, and I'm swimming from here to Crocker's Cove, that I would probably get out of the water here. I wouldn't swim past that point all the way into the beach. I'd get out as soon as I could. So I can only assume that this young fellow got off this island and swam to this point, and from there he walked to Heart's Content. Now we drove from Carboneer to Heart's Content on Friday to let the little ones have a nap. And some of my family lives over that way, so so we'll drive that way. They'll have a little sleep. And we went as far we went to Heart's Content. And uh, on the highway, it says 14 kilometers from when we left Carbonier and that. And in the book, he said it was 12 miles. So I, I don't know how far from Crocker's Cove, but somewhere between 12 miles-ish, he walked after swimming that distance, which I have no idea, half a kilometer, a kilometer, something like that, walk, walked 12 miles to Heart's Content because that's where the French forces had their base. And he got there, frostbitten, they took care of him, and he joined the French forces. Why did he do that? He wanted freedom. He did not want to be a prisoner on that island. He wanted freedom. So he was willing to risk swimming the North Atlantic Ocean in January and walk 12 miles in his wet clothes for freedom. He wanted freedom. I was talking to Pastor Holman, uh, my father-in-law, just before we went to Carboneer. I said, I don't even know who's preaching at this meeting. I hadn't been asked to preach, and uh, so I didn't know who was preaching. And he said, well, I'm preaching Friday night. And then he said, and I'm preaching on David and Goliath. So, I mean, I've heard him preach. Uh, I, when I went to Bible College in 1992 is when I first started hearing him preach because he was at the Bible College working. I've heard him preach a lot of times. And I've heard the story of David Goliath more than once. Friday night, he preached, and we went downstairs after for cake. And I walked over to the table he was sitting at, and I said, listen, I have heard the story of David and Goliath a lot of times. But I learned new stuff tonight. It was incredible. And uh, he basically had two main points. He said, why shouldn't David have fought Goliath? 
uh, and, and basically I'm saying, we all have giants in our life, things we're gonna face. Why shouldn't we face the giant? What should stop us from facing the giant? He said, well, consider what you have to face. Daniel faced the giant. He said, what if you're the only one to do it? I mean, there was a full army there, none of them, or all of them together would not go and fight. David, as a teenage boy, was the only one to go out. He said, the reward is not worth the risk. In 1 Samuel 25, I told you to turn there a long time ago. 1 Samuel 17 and 25, have the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up surely to divide Israel as he come up? And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. The rewards were riches. He'd become part of the royal family and he would probably be free uh, from taxes and such things in Israel. But for every other soldier, that reward was not worth the risk because there was a great chance if you face that giant alone, you're going to die. So all these things mean zero if you're dead. <laughs> so he said, others, uh, the, the reward is not worth the risk. Others will not understand. Others will think you're insignificant. They told David, you're too young, you're too small, you can't even fit the man's armor. They questioned his motives. His brother said, you're only here to see the battle because you're nosy and you're curious, little brat, go home. That's in the Greek or Hebrew. The old doesn't written in Hebrew. There. And you've never done it before. He said, well, I fought a bear and I fought a lion. No, I haven't fought a giant, but God helped me do that and God will help me do this. But those are the reasons he gave why he shouldn't do that. But then he said, here are the reasons you should fight the giant. The honor of God's people is at stake. He defied the armies of Israel, and the honor of the Lord is at stake, because he defied the living God. He cursed him and mocked him. That's why you need to fight the giant. And you need to face the giant, because where God leads, he will provide and protect. And God has prepared you for facing that giant. David had prepared by fighting a lion, by fighting a bear, by learning how to use a sling, how learning how to trust God. God had prepared him, and God had given him everything he needed. And you need to face the giant. Even if others underestimate you. If you remember it's all about the Lord. You remember that God will give the victory, and that your faith will strengthen and encourage and motivate others. I say all that to say that David was willing to face the giant, not for the riches, not to be part of the royal family, not for the right to be free in his own country, but this giant was stopping Israel from worshiping God, from going about their daily business. It was stopping them from honoring God and they were mocking the honor of God's name. And David said, we need to be free from this. David desired freedom. David trusted God. God won the victory. Others were empowered. Later on in the chapter of the story of David and Goliath, the army of Israel chase away the army of the Philistines because their giant was dead. True freedom this morning is not political. The true freedom is not religious. True freedom is spiritual. You can be spiritually free and live in a politically closed country. True freedom is not political. You know, our political leaders can make whatever decisions they want. That will not hinder my relationship with God. They cannot stop me from loving God. They cannot stop me from honoring God with my life. They can make rules, but true freedom is not political. True freedom is not religious. There have been, throughout history, countries have not allowed people to worship God. People have worshipped God under the threat of death. And even in our world today, in countries like Nigeria and some other places, there are people that are losing their lives because they say, 
I am worshiping Jesus, the God of heaven, and not some other God, some false God. So true freedom is not religious freedom because we have the freedoms today to, to meet in a public building. And, and we have the freedoms to read God's word. And I understand this whole singing thing that you know we can't sing right now. I understand the, the thought process behind it. And, and you know, but this can't go on forever. The government is, uh, uh, they're trying to help. I understand that. And as a church, we need to have a good testimony. And we need to do our best to, uh, to be able to support our government and pray for them. But when the government says to us, you can't preach the gospel, then there's other decisions that need to be made. But true freedom is not political. True freedom is not religious. Because we can gather together as a, a religious group, because we believe a certain set of doctrines, and we're allowed to worship them, and we're allowed to and we're allowed to, to worship God, and we're allowed to propagate our gospel and tell other people about it. Because we're allowed to, that's still not true freedom. True freedom is spiritual. I want you now to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 6. Now that was all introduction. Now we're up to the main point. I won't be as long. All the wars that have fought, been fought, all the lives that have been lost over the years are because people want freedom. But true freedom is not political, it's not religious, it's spiritual. Now we read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, and it spoke of being free from sin. Notice if you move down now to verse 15 in Romans chapter 6, What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have Yielded. Sorry, I lost my spot. I'm looking at my microphone here. Sound like I'm doing something funny. Back in 19, let's start verse 19 again. I speak after the manner of man because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof ye are not ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end ever... ...is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we think about this thought that true freedom is spiritual, it is not religious, it is not political, true freedom is spiritual, I ask you this morning, are you free from sin's condemnation? Are you free from sin's condemnation? These verses here tell us that we were the servants of sin, that we had decided to do our own thing until we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Then the condemnation of sin is taken away. He said you can be servants to unrighteousness and uncleanness, or you can be free from that condemnation and be servants of righteousness. It says the end of unrighteousness, the end of sin and iniquity is death in verse 21. The wages of sin is death in verse 23. But the gift of God is eternal life. Look, if you've got your Bible open to Romans 6, turn over just a page or two to Romans 8. Romans 8, look at verse 1. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We are not condemned to a Christless eternity. We are not condemned to an eternity without being in God's presence. Are you free from sins, condemnation? We desire freedom. Every war that has been fought is because somebody wants to be free from something. That young man that jumped in the North Atlantic that day from that island wanted freedom. He did not want to be a slave. He did not want to be a prisoner. And he was willing to risk his life because he wanted freedom. I don't want to live under condemnation. I don't want to live thinking that someday I will have to pay for my own sin through eternal death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you have prayed and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and be your Savior, there is no condemnation. But I have another question for you. Go back to the Gospel of John, now chapter 8. The Gospel of John, chapter 8. Verse number 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. My first question was, are you free from sin's condemnation? Sin condemns every person to death. That's why there's physical death on the earth, because sin came out of God and said, if you sin against me, you will die. And the day that Adam and Eve sinned, they did not fall over dead. They didn't die physically that day, but they did die spiritually. Because up until that, that point in the evening, God would come and meet with them. But after that day, God said, I can't meet with you anymore. I cannot be in the presence of sin. And they died spiritually that day, and eventually they died physically. Because God said, you will die. So physical death for us is a result of sin. Spiritual death, that broken relationship with God is a result of sin. And that condemnation of death rests on every person until they ask God to remove the sin, thereby removing the condemnation. And Jesus died on the cross. He paid for our sin. And he said, if, you, if we'll, he will take our sin away because it's paid for. And he gives us eternal life. So we can be free from sin's condemnation. But I ask you this morning, are you free from sin's slavery? Free from sin's slavery. Jesus said, if you obey me and continue in my word, you are my disciples. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the Jewish people that he had talked to, they said, what do you mean? We're the children of Abraham. We've always been free. And I begin to think, well, you were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, and you were taken captive by Babylon for 70 years, and you go back through the... So they can say they were free, but they were not free because they have been taken captive by many countries, and God had to keep delivering them. But Jesus was not speaking of political freedom. He was not speaking of religious freedom. He was speaking of spiritual freedom. Jesus answered, he said, Verily I say unto you, in verse 34, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And he said, the servant doesn't abide in the house forever. He said, the servant or the slave is not kept in the house. He is pushed out. But he said, the son abideth forever. He said, if the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. 
Are you free from sin's slavery? We read this morning from Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior and he has removed the condemnation of sin, why would we say, well, now I can live however I want because God has forgiven me? Shall we continue in sin so God's grace can abound? God forbid. Let's not be slaves to sin. Let's be free from that slavery. Let's live in righteousness because if Jesus shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Nobody can make any rules that will hinder my spiritual relationship with God. The only one that can hinder it is me. Satan can do whatever he wants. Satan can try to deceive me and distract me and discourage me and depress me. God, Satan can try that. But it will only work if I let it. If I don't allow God to give me the strength, if I don't trust God, if I allow Jesus to make me free, I'll be free indeed. True freedom is spiritual. Freedom from the condemnation of sin. If I trust Jesus as my Savior, I do not have to fear eternal death or hell wire because I have a home in heaven. And if I am free through Jesus Christ, I am not a slave to sin. I don't need to go back to that old life. I don't have to commit those things. I don't need those things to give me joy because joy, true joy, only comes from Jesus. So do you long today, do you desire to be free from the condemnation of sin? Come to Jesus. Do you long to be free from the slavery to sin? Trust in Jesus. Are you willing to do what it takes to be free? Think of these soldiers that went to battle over many, many years, risking death. Think of this young boy that jumped from that island and swam because he wanted freedom. Think of David walking out to face Goliath alone because he wanted freedom. Say, oh, it's so hard to do right. Only if we make it hard. Only if we make it hard. Because true freedom is spiritual. If we want to do right, we'll trust God. And God will help us do the right things. Believe in Jesus. Forsake Satan. Forgive. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity. And Lord, as we come before you at the end of this service, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God has touched our heart and has helped us. Lord, in just a moment, as we'll have a moment of quiet reflection, that you will help us, Lord, to, if there's something in our heart and life that needs to be confessed and forsaken, that we could have true freedom. Or if there's someone that has heard this message this morning, and they need to know you as their personal Savior, I pray that today they would understand it well enough to ask Jesus to save them. Lord, if there's someone who has heard this that has trusted you as their Savior, they are confident in their eternal salvation and their home in heaven but are losing the battles, are giving in to sin, are slaves to sin, help them today to understand you can help them. You can give them the strength and the grace to say no to those temptations and to do what is right. Lord, help us to desire true spiritual freedom that we can only get in Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, Amy is going to play for us one verse of Just As I Am. While she's playing, if God has touched your heart today, would you talk to him? Ask him for whatever you need. Talk to him about whatever is, uh, is in your heart today. And just take a moment and ask for his help while Amy plays. <laughs>
opportunity to be in your house today. Lord, I pray that this week we would take time to remember the many who have given their lives for the freedoms we enjoy here in our country. But Lord, help us also to remember what Jesus sacrificed to give us true spiritual freedom. Well, help us to remember that every day. Thank you for this morning and how you've helped us. Be with us now as we go our separate ways, and we ask that you bless our service again this evening. Thank you so much now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. I encourage you again to uh, this week to take time on Thursday to remember those that have sacrificed so much for us. If you're able to join us tonight, we'll be here at 6 and again on Wednesday. Thank you so much. God bless you. You are dismissed.